Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. We're very excited for uh, the presentation that's going to take place. It's the first uh, of this kind of presentation for uh, Ken and Kevin. Uh, but to begin, we're just going to go over some housekeeping uh, and then lead right into the presentation. They have so much to offer and share to us. So uh, to begin, uh, welcome to VizConnect, connecting you with the art of data visualization and storytelling. And please uh, jump into our BizConnect on YouTube. We have over 2.3 thousand subs on, on their con new content coming in every week from uh, great community all-stars to ambassadors and Zen masters sharing so many tips, tricks, and, and uh, inspirational bits for you. So just make sure that you uh, go ahead and uh, jump on there and be part of it and set the alert so you have an alert every time a new video comes up. Uh, we also have a LinkedIn uh, community, so uh, check us out on LinkedIn. It's uh, BizConnect, uh, and uh, join our growing community there. We almost have 1,900 members, and we also have a, a Tableau community hub. So if you um, look up BizConnect um, Tableau community, um, you'll find that um, you could access our community hub. So it has the most up-to-date information on there, uh, including uh, upcoming episodes, a description of BizConnect and some uh, resources that you could access immediately and have at your fingertips. One more thing I would like to bring up, and we're doing a little bit of a drive for mentoring meetup. Sorry for the uh, danger zone red we have here, but um, uh, that's our uh, those are our colors and we need more mentors. Uh, right now we're doing inventory and we're not accepting new mentees at this time, but we will uh, next month. But if you jump on the mentoringmeetup.com, want to be a mentor, please do sign up. Um, select what I have circled there on the top and uh, complete the form. And we're gonna, we'll work with you to uh, align you with somebody that you could work with uh, to mentor. Uh, all you need to have are uh, intermediate skills or verifiable and a verifiable portfolio. So we could just verify that um, you uh, can mentor and have the capabilities of mentoring at this point but it's such a rewarding experience and don't miss out on it. And without further ado, we have uh, uh, VizConnect's uh, season three, episode eight with Kevin and Ken Florlich. So in this presentation, identical twins in Tableaus and Masters, Ken and Kevin Florlich, will be digging a little deeper as they demonstrate Tableau techniques that may not be widely used, but should be. Uh, the Florlich twins will introduce four general techniques then dig into numerous use cases for each. So with that, um, I'll uh, introduce uh, Kevin as he's gonna begin the presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Adam. Let's see if I can share my screen. And share. Everybody see it okay? Oh, I hit the wrong thing. Oh, um, one more thing I'll bring up is uh, just make sure that if you have questions, um, we'll answer, if time permitting, we'll answer at the end of the demonstration. Um, they're probably going to go over a lot of things that you'll, that will answer your questions in the meantime. So uh, just make sure that we'll see your questions and we'll give them the opportunity to answer those at the end of the presentation. Thank you. Adam, you can see me. You see my screen okay? Yep, looks beautiful. All right. Perfect. Thanks, Adam. Thank you, Cigar, for having us. Uh, my name is Kevin Flerlidge. I am presenting today with my identical twin brother, Ken Flerlidge. I'm on the left. Uh, Ken's on the right. You can see our shirts say Flerlidge Twins. We run the Flerlidge Twins website. And as of yesterday, uh, we are Tableau Zen Masters uh, for 2021 as well. So uh, we are Tableau Zen Masters and identical twins. So really cool to be able to share that together. We're identical twins, so uh, naturally people always want to know how alike are we. So I guess we can dig into that a little bit. Uh, we can start maybe where where we live. So I live where we, where I grew up in Burlington, Kentucky. It's about 20 minutes outside of Cincinnati, Ohio. That's where I work. Uh, that's where uh, my office is. Uh, Ken lives in Williamsport, Pennsylvania, which is 20 minutes outside of absolutely nothing. There's some cow pastures there, I think, but that's pretty much it uh what we like to visualize ken likes to uh visualize topics like religion 
war, endangered species, and, and politics, where I like to really hit, you know, the hard hitting subjects like Adam Sandler, video games, cartoons, and even famous hot dog eating competitions. But ultimately, what everybody wants to know is who's the best at this stuff, right? So we can use some data to get at that. Uh, if you're not familiar, Josh Tapley created something called Cerebro. I, hopefully I pronounced that right, uh, where he grabbed, uh, you know, with an Alteryx workflow, grabs a couple hundred thousand authors on Tableau Public, and he looks at, uh, you know, rankings by number of views, by, by favorites, by followers. So if we zoom in here to this favorites thing, we can see that pesky Andy Kreeble always at the top with 11,000 some favorites, but you see yours truly, number two, and Ken, a distant third, uh, that's pretty, uh, pretty lame there, Ken. And if we look at number of followers, uh, we kind of see something very similar. Andy Kreeble, again, at the top of the list, me in, in third place, and Ken falling way behind the pack in sixth place out of, you know, a couple hundred thousand, so. Um, we could talk about, uh, uh, you know, our, the most favorite of this. Uh, this biz is all right. All right. All right. Kind of like, <laughs> you could get the right. idea here, man. All right. All right. That's fine. <laughs> I mean, the, the truth. It, we, I do this because uh, we just like to start off a presentation with a little bit of fun. We don't want it to be boring. Uh, the truth is, Ken was a Tableau Zen master uh, before I even downloaded the software. He's a four times Zen. I'm a two times Zen. Uh, he basically taught me the software. He was a mentor. He's my best friend and he's better at this stuff than I'll ever dream of. So I say all this in jest and uh, it, Ken, is, Ken is awesome. So now we have the mushy stuff out of the way. Let's get to the actual real about us section. Uh, we are identical twins and Zen masters. Uh, we're both Tableau ambassadors. I'm a Tableau public ambassador. He is a Tableau forums ambassador. We run Hello, it's twins.com and for uh, a living, Ken is the assistant director of data analytics at Bucknell University up in Pennsylvania. And I'm the manager of business intelligence at a company called Unifun in Cincinnati, Ohio, which is led by Jeffrey Schaefer, five times Zen, and now uh, Tableau Zen Master Hall of Famer. So today we're going to be talking about Tableau techniques, but just not any Tableau technique. These things are going to be a little bit obscure, perhaps, or random. Uh, maybe a little bit un, underutilized or even unknown, but generally they're going to be very, very useful. And as Adam mentioned earlier, we're going to really dig into four different techniques and we'll break down uh, numerous uh, different use cases for all those techniques. Don't worry about taking notes. Uh, this obviously is being recorded, but at the same time, all the different blog posts that go along with these techniques are listed on this one different one one page. So you just go here and have all the different blog posts that are corresponding with the technique that we're, we're going to go over today. So with that, I am going to pass the ball to Ken, and he's going to get us started. All right. Thanks, Kev. Tableau here. Yeah, we can see it. Yep. Okay. Good. All right. So I, I've got two sections here that I'm going to run through. Uh, the first is is our, te our techniques that I call hidden in plain sight. So these are sort of random. Um, these are these are techniques that are are really easy to execute, uh, but may not necessarily be well known by everybody. Uh, in fact. Uh, at least half of these uh, I've just learned probably within the last year. Or so um, I figured that'd be, be interesting to share these and, and maybe maybe you'll learn something new along the way. Uh, my section, second section uh, is uh, we're going to get into a little bit more technical area uh, and dig into the order of operations. So let's let's hit the ground running here with some hidden and plain sight techniques. So the first thing I want to talk about is hiding marks so it's a common sort of situation where you have a line chart like this and you want to highlight the min and max values as i as i've done here and what i typically do for this is um, we'll start out by creating a calculated field and we'll get into detail here but basically we're just finding which of these points is our min which is our max and 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 then marking the rest as well 
And then I'll create a calculated field that basically just brings back the measure that I'm measuring uh, for those min and max values. Then I'll use that as a, as a dual axis here and we'll color by that high low field and we get this sort of effect. And because each of these other marks has a null value, there's no mark that appears. Uh, and so that's historically been how I, how I applied this technique. But uh, what I've just recently discovered, and this is a super simple one, but this, is, this can be made much easier. So we'll still need the high low calculated field. But instead of using the second field, we'll just we'll just add sales to the dual axis, and we end up getting each uh, each point with a with its mark. Then all we have to do is right click this legend, click hide, and it will automatically remove those. So I don't have to do that secondary calculated field, uh, and it's just super simple to do that. Now there might be some times where you don't want the coloring. Right, so if you don't want the coloring, you'd end up sort of dropping that off the pill and then you end up getting these marks anyway. Uh, so to 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 exclude the coloring and, and still hide these marks, we, we can first start off by dragging that pill to the color. Hiding the one that we don't want, and then if you drag that to detail, then you'll get nice gray uh, little little circles for the high and low. So that's again one I just recently learned, uh, and I think it has a lot of interesting use cases. So it's it's a good one to to, to keep in mind in the future. Um, second one I want to show has to do with highlight tables. So here's a simple highlight table that shows segment and subcategory with profit ratio. And and what I want to do is is use some color to sort of bring out um, some focus areas here. So in particular, I want to show the two highest profit uh, ratios and the two lowest ones. And I want to show them in two in four separate colors, as you can see here. So what you might be tempted to do is create a sort of uh, calculated field like this. So this base, this is a, a rank of, of those profit ratios. So I'm basically bringing back either top one, top two, bottom two, or bottom one, these discrete values that, that describe that field. Um, and then what you might think you Think you could do is drag that to color, drag, change it to square, and then you start fiddling with the size here to try to get it to line up. And no matter what you do, these marks end up sort of overlapping each other, and you can't really tell what color goes with what. Um, so my historically, my approach for dealing with this issue has been to change this calculated field to have numeric values. So these numeric values are sort of in a range here. And by using numeric values, I can get a, I can get a continuous pill, and continuous pills don't have that same issue as you can see here. So that's one possible solution to this problem. Um, but there there are some limitations to this as well. So if I edit the colors, um, one thing I want to do is have this middle color be white, just the same as the background. So I can fix that by choosing this orange, blue, white diverging palette, and we get white in the middle. But if I want to sort of individually change any of these colors, it starts to become problematic, particularly if I want to change the light blue or the light orange. The only real way to do that is by going and creating a, a custom diverging color palette. And then any, anytime I want to make little small tweaks to that palette, I have to go outside of Tableau, close Tableau, bring it back up, and then keep testing it until I get it just right. So that's kind of a pain. Uh, it would be really great if we could use a discrete pill to do a highlight table like this. So I just learned this probably within the last month. Uh, so I'll show you. Add our discrete pill to color, change to a square again. We're back in the same situation as we were before. Uh, but if we just create these inline calculations on columns and rows. So I just created a sort of double quote, double two double quotes. So basically an empty string here. And I'm going to create that on the rows shelf as well. So you can see it's created that new pill here. Let's uh, resize this a bit so we get each of our categories. Now I'm just going to hide these pills that are the headers. So they're still there, but they're hidden. And I'll just resize these. And now you see because of those, those additional pills, uh, these marks are confined within their space. And you get the nice, nice highlight table. But the best part of this is if I edit the colors, they're all discrete values. So I can individually change these 
without any real problems and I get exactly the colors I want and I can easily go back and adjust those as desired. So this is my new favorite method for doing a highlight table uh, you know, with, with a discrete pill like this. All right, so the next thing I'll, I'll talk about is the difference between duplicating and calculating, or and sorry, duplicating and copying and pasting calculated fields. Uh, and I, I, up until recently, didn't know there was a difference at all with this. So to, to demonstrate this, I'm going to show you two calculated fields that I have. So I have a profit ratio calculated field, and I have a profit ratio text calculated field. So this text calculated field is basically just a sentence that uses this profit ratio. So uh, if so one uh, option for copying those is to select both of them and do duplicate. And you'll see it creates these copies of those. Let's take a look at those. So as you might expect, profit ratio is the same as the original profit ratio. And our profit ratio text uh, looks pretty much the same as well. The point I wanna make here is that this profit ratio field that it's that it's referencing is the original one. It was the source that we copied from, not the new one that we've created. So the other method for copying calculated fields is to select these and we'll do copy and then paste. And we'll see that we've got two new calculated fields again. Profit ratio, once again, as we'd expect, looked exactly like the original one. Profit ratio text, there's a key difference here. So you'll see here that this is not referring to the original profit ratio, it's referring to the one that I've copied. So that's the real difference between duplicate and copy and paste. Dupl duplicate will retain those references to the original calculated field or, or original field, and the copy and paste will sort of re-reference all these to the, to the set of copied ones. Now that might not seem like a, a huge thing uh, to be able to do, but there are times where you have a whole big group of calculated fields that are all sort of referencing each other. And when you duplicate those and they, they, they reference the original fields, that can be really problematic. And a good example is a Sankey. So I do a lot of work with, with Sankeys. And so we have a, a Sankey here with, with three flows. And each of these sets of flows has their own calculated fields. And if I want to create a fourth flow, have to duplicate a bunch of calculated fields and specifically uh, all of these calculated fields. So there's a lot of them that are sort of building on top of each other, figuring out the math to draw these curves. So if I were to duplicate these, I have to go into each and every one and change those references. Whereas if I copy and paste, it, it creates those new references to the copied fields and it really ends up saving me a lot of time. So I just encourage you as you're you know, creating calculated fields and you need to make copies of those. Think about whether it's best to duplicate or do the copy and paste. And in the end, I think you'll you'll end up saving yourself a bunch of time potentially. All right, so one last sort of random technique here has to do with Excel tables. So, I, you know, I've seen in, in my career that often uh, people will, will give me really weirdly formatted Excel files. So here's an example <clears throat> where we actually have two totally separate pieces of data within one sheet in Excel. Uh, so we have some author and novel data, some Russian, Russian novels, and then we have subcategory by sales. And <clears throat> if I try to connect to this in Tableau, uh, I end up with this just sort of mess where this is all sort of smashed together and it's really hard to deal with this. So there are a couple of techniques that we can use to uh, to correct this issue. One is if we go back to Excel, we can select this, this table data, and then we can click this button format as table. And we'll select a format. This is just a visual format in Excel, but by selecting this, we're telling Excel that this is a table inside of it. So it's sort of a different thing than just columns and rows and cells. <clears throat> and we will do the same thing here with this table. And <clears throat> I'll save this. Now let's go back to Tableau. Now I'm going to reconnect and we'll connect back to this, this new file that I just created. And you'll see uh, it still has the original table sheet, but it also has created these two individual tables. And if I drag those on, you'll see 
just those sort of specific, the, the specific rush novels and uh, then our subcategory sales. So we can now work with these individually um, as separate tables, even though they're all crammed in one sheet in Excel. So I think that's a really cool little thing. Um, as I said before, a lot of these I've just learned recently. This is one of them, but actually in the process of preparing this presentation, I learned something new that, that will allow us to actually skip that step in Excel. So let's go back to the, uh, the non-formatted one, and we have our problematic tables here. Uh, if we use the inter data interpreter, let's click this button, Tableau is really, really smart. It sees that there are two sort of sections of data, and it actually creates these sort of virtual tables for you. So you see this first table here is our Russian novels. The second table is our subcategory sales. So we don't even need to go and format those as, as tables in Excel. We can just use the data interpreter. So my recommendation to you is, you know, uh, if you have messy Excel data, try using the data interpreter. A lot of times it'll it'll figure out what you have and clean it up. Uh, and then if you need to, you can go back to Excel and do the formatting as tables if you like. Uh, one other thing I'll mention is, in, in addition to formatting as tables, you can also do Excel named ranges. I won't show you that, but uh, it'll do a similar thing and bring those named ranges in as uh, separate tables in Tableau. All right, so those are my hidden insight techniques that I think are really valuable. Uh, now we're going to get a little bit more technical uh, and and a little bit deeper into the, the guts of Tableau, and we're going to talk about the order of operations. So the order of operations in Tableau is, in my opinion, one of the most critical things to know and understand. Um, if you know the way and order that things are computing, you can really kind of leverage that and, and bend Tableau to, to your will. Uh, so let's talk first a, a little bit, just briefly we'll introduce, introduce the order of operations here. Uh, this is the typical diagram that you'll see in Tableau documentation. Uh, at the top are the things that get executed early in the order of operations. At the bottom, we have things that are executed late in the order of operations. So, of course, the first thing that gets executed or computed is are the extract filters. And then the very last thing here we have are trend lines and reference lines. So we're gonna we're gonna keep referring back to this diagram and we'll highlight different pieces as we go along here. But there are a number of sort of common problems that I often see people running into uh, with the order of operations. Uh, and so I want to share some of those problems as well as some some really interesting and cool techniques for for addressing those. So the first common problem I see with, uh, with people with the order of operations is with a fixed level of detail calculations. <clears throat> so what we have here is a table that shows each of our customers in Superstore and their first order date. And we're using a fixed LOD for this, just basically grabbing for each customer the minimum order date. And this works great, uh, but what I would like to be able to do is filter in on specific categories here and say, for example, you know, what was Aaron Bergman's first uh, technology or so what I've done is I've added a category filter here. You can see my filter over here. So if I start deselecting items to just see te technology, um, I would expect some of these values to change, but no matter what combination I do, the values are staying the same. So what's going on here? Well, as you might expect, this is an order of operations problem. So let's take a look at the order of operations and the, the elements that we're using here. So uh, the first element we're using is that fixed LOD. You can see that here. And we're using a dimension filter for, uh, for the category. So as you can see here visually, that fixed LOD is actually being computed before the dimension filter. So what it's doing is it's looking at the entire data set uh, for each customer and getting each customer's first order date. And then after doing that, it's filtering by category. So it's filtering sort of that subset of data down to category. And uh, we don't really want that in this case. What we really want is that category filter to compute first, and then we find the minimum order date for each of those customers. So to do that, we just want to transition this dimension filter to a context filter. And that's pretty easily done here. Uh, if we go back to our view, we just right click our filter choose add to context, it'll turn it gray, we'll keep that it's a context filter. 
And now you'll see that as I do select things, we'll get some different values in that first order date. So that's probably, in my mind, the most common issue I see with people that are just sort of new to LODs and new to the order of operations. So understanding dimension and context filters is really critical to how all this works. Uh, let me show you another example with, with context filters, and that's a, a top end list. So what I have here is a, a, the top 15 customers by sales. And to get the top 15, I've used a, a, a filter on customer name, and I've chosen this top 15 option. So I'm doing top 15 by sales. So I'll get my top 15 customers by sales. This looks great. Uh, like the last example, I might want to be able to, to do some filtering ahead of time of this. So <clears throat> I'm looking at all of my customers for all of my data here. Uh, but what if I just wanted to look at specific years? So I've added a filter on year, and we can start to de deselect some of these, and I think we'll start to see some problems here. So when we go down to just 2020, uh, we see, see two kind of clear problems. One is that I no longer have a top 15 list, I only have 14. Uh, I know there are more than 15 customers in, in 2020, so something's not right there. Uh, the other thing I noticed is that this last customer only has $13 of sales. And uh, it does just doesn't make sense that our 14th largest customer would only have $13 of sales. So that's an indication that there's something wrong here that I need to correct. Uh, so let's look at the order of operations and the different things we're using here. So pretty similar to last time, uh, and we're using this top end filter here. And then our year filter is a dimension filter. So once again, the top end is computing first, and then the filter is computing. So basically what Tableau is doing is it's looking at the entire data set, all years, grabbing its 15 top customers overall, and then that year filter is then further filtering that sort of subset of data. So the reason we drop that one customer off there is that one of our top 15 customers overall didn't have any sales in 2020, so they dropped off the list when we filtered down to 2020. So just like the last one, what we really wanna do is move that dimension filter up, up to a context filter. Let's go back, let's add that to context, and we'll see we get a 15 and we get some more reasonable numbers. All right, so talking about uh, top end lists, um, I, there are some other te techniques for doing top ends as well. So, uh, so let's look at a, a slightly different technique that uses uh, an index or a calculated or a table calculation. So instead of the top end filter on customer name, what I've done is created an index calculated field. So index, if you're not familiar with it, it basically just uh, adds a unique running number uh, for each row. So one, two, three, four, five, et cetera. And of course, it all depends on how it's computed um, and things like that. But um, what I've done is I've dragged that up to filters and I've set it to do at least or, or at most 15. So it's going to give me my top 15 in this case. But one I want to point out to you is that I still have that year filter. And if I start to filter down to specific years, I don't see the same problem here as I had with the other approach. And once again, this, this all has to do with the order of operations. So if we look at the order of operations, index field, it's a table calculation. So I, when I use it as a filter, it becomes a table calc filter. And that gets computed really, really far down in the order of operations. Uh, and it doesn't really matter in my case whether my year filter is a dimension filter or a context filter because table calc filters still compute afterwards. And just to prove that, uh, I can add this to context and you'll see that there's no real difference in the results. And it is the same results as we got with the, the top end. So uh, depending on your use case, depending on you know, how you need things to compute in what order, depending on the, the types of calculated fields you're using, uh, these two different approaches for top end, uh, for top end lists uh, can be very valuable. And it's just a matter of working out which one's best. Um, I usually recommend starting with the top end, but if you start to run into these order of operations problems, uh, then, then sometimes you might find yourself using an index uh, calculated field like this. So since we're on the topic of uh, table calc filters, 
these have a ton of really cool use cases. So I'm going to actually show you two more, two more use cases for, for uh, table count filters. Uh, one is, uh, one example here I have is a list of our cities in the U.S. and their sales, and they're all ranked here. Uh, so New York City is the first. Uh, what I want to point out mainly is that Philadelphia, Pennsylvania here is number five. Uh, now, this is a long list, and so, you know, maybe people want to look at their state or whatever and figure out where things are uh, for their particular state. Um, so what I've done is I've added a state filter. You can see the filter here. And what I want to do, I live in Pennsylvania, so I'm going to filter down to Pennsylvania. And we can see we get just our Pennsylvania cities, but what's happened is it's changed the ranks. So it's ranking these for all the cities within Pennsylvania. And what I really want in this case is to retain the overall rank. I want to see five for, for Philadelphia. So I want to retain that original US rank, but then filter down to just my state. So how can we do that with, with the order of operations? Well, let's take a look and see what, what our options are. So what I have right now is a dimension filter on the state, and I have a table count for that rank. So dimension filters, as we can clearly see, compute first. So what's happening is it's filtering the data down to Pennsylvania and then doing that rank. Uh, so I, you know, I, I don't want, uh, I, I don't actually want that. What I want is this table cap to compute first and then the rank. And if we look at this uh, order of operations, there's really only one option for us to do that. And that's these table cap filters. So if we can somehow convert that dimension filter to a table cap filter, then we can we can bend this to our will and, and make it do what we want it to do, right? So uh, this is a trick that I learned from uh, former Zen master Pooja Gandhi, uh, and I use it all the time. So what we're going to do is create a calculated field like this. So lookup is basically looking up a, a, a prior or a future row in, in your in your data. Um, what we're doing is doing a lookup of the state with an offset of zero. So an offset of zero is basically just going to return the same value. Uh, so, but but the trick here is that we're we're changing. So why would you change the same value, right? Well, the trick is we're forcing it into being a table calculation, and by forcing it to be a table calculation, we can filter on it and it will compute after the regular table calculation rank. So let's filter on this instead of our dimension filter. We'll choose Pennsylvania here, and you can see that it's retained our ranks here. So that's a really powerful one for forcing filters to sort of com compute last in the in the process. And I, you know, it, it may seem like sort of a niche use case, but it's something I use all the time, and it's really really powerful. All right, so one more tip, and this is also a, a table count filter tip. Uh, it's a common thing for you to want to create sort of a, a band that you can put on your you know, big angry dash, uh, big angry number to put on your uh, dashboard. Uh, in this case, what I have is a, a band that shows my sales growth 2019 over 2020 to 2020. So you can see we get 20% there. Um, and I'm going to show you how to use do this using a table calculation uh, and and some fancy filtering here. So. What you might start out with is, is a table by year. So we've got our year, our sales, and then we have a quick table calculation that just does percent of difference. Right? We get our 20% 20, 20 number here. But to create a band out of this, we really need to isolate this number and get rid of all this other stuff. So you might be tempted to just filter on the year and try to remove 29. But the problem is, and we have an order of operations problem here. This is a dimension filter. So that's computing before the table calc. So the, so the table calc and the table calc needs the previous year's data on there to get that 20%. So that's not going to work for us. What we really need is to force something to happen later. Now we could use uh, a similar technique to what we just, just did with the uh, lookup, but there's another way we could do that using this, this uh, cool last function. So there, there's these two functions, last and first. So last will basically count the number of rows from the last partition, and first will count the number of rows from the first partition. So in this case, our last uh, last row is 2020. So last is going to be zero for this one. 2019, last is going to be one. 
So on my calculated field, I said, if last is zero, then true, else false. This last row. So I'm going to take this and use that as a filter and select just true. And because this is a table calc filter, the table calc here will compute first and then we'll filter the data. So I'm not losing that 20% that number that I want. Now, what we can do is just hide the header for the year. We can remove this sales measure, hide the header for difference here. Now, I'll change it to entire view and make this much larger. And we have this nice, beautiful band that we can put on our dashboard and, and give us an idea of what the sales growth year over year is. Oh, shoot. Uh, you know, I, 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 you probably all have this problem where you created a band like this and, and it's text based and you end up clicking on it and it's selecting. I, you know, I really wish there was a solution to this problem, Kev. I, I don't know. Maybe we can find one at some point. Anyway, uh, that's order of operations, super powerful, lots of individual techniques here. Uh, check out the link that Kevin shared earlier. There are some additional uh, common problems and techniques that I've shared there. Uh, and so you can, and, and most of these are repeated there as well. So you can go back and uh, review those again. So that's it for me. I'm going to hand it back over to Kevin and he's going to share his two sections with you. Thank you, Ken. Let me share my. Workbook. Don't want that one. Let's see where the heck I am. All right. Everybody see my uh, Tableau workbook? Ken, can you see it? Okay. We could see. It. All right. Perfect. All right. I'm going to be talking um, uh, first about creative uses of navigation buttons. So this will be a little lighter, I think. Uh, so first off, what's a navigation button? This is something that came out in 2018.3. It's crazy that I know all the different versions of when these stuff, things came out. But let's say we have two different dashboards in a workbook. Uh, we got a scatter plot and some bar charts. We can use a navigation button to allow us to navigate between those two dashboards. We don't have to use story points or anything like that anymore. So we drag navigation button to the view. We edit that button. Uh, we can make it go to the bar charts tab. That's going to tell us where to navigate to. We can use a text button or an image button. I'll come back to the image button here momentarily, but we can add some text here. We can change the font type, the color, the background color. I'm not going to do any of that right now. I'm just going to hit OK. And now if I click on the bar chart button, it's going to go to the bar chart dashboard. So that's really nice and handy and is really streamlined a lot of things that I do. Uh, the one thing I don't love about the button, especially this text button, is this really blocky look. Um, just for me, it's just not a very pretty button. So um, I've always historically drawn my buttons in PowerPoint. I have some tutorials on our website how to do that. I'm not going to get into that today. Uh, but to kind of save you some problems, and because we've seen so many people kind of struggle with it, Ken and I decided to create a bunch of buttons for you. So this is a, a Tableau workbook and it has a download uh, template in, in the PowerPoint. You can download this and you get a hundred different custom buttons. You can change the colors or the fonts and the text and the, and the little icons. Uh, we even have some new morphism buttons and some toggles, all kinds of stuff. So you'll find that on my Tableau public page to make buttons a little bit easier. Some things I like to do with custom buttons are um, not only provide navigation, but to kind of tell a user where they're at. So this uh, dashboard I created uh, probably a couple of years ago, it looks at uh, Major League Baseball win streaks. And if you're not aware, Major League Baseball has six different divisions, three in the American League and three in the National League. Well, I have six different dashboards in this in the workbook. And I wanted to allow users to navigate to those different uh, divisions, but at the same time, I wanted to use the buttons to tell them where they're at. So if we want to go to the National League West, we click the button and it clearly notates that they're in the National League West. I also like to use, uh, navig I hit the escape button, it's taking a little bit. I also like to use navigation buttons to kind of replicate some of the things that Windows does naturally. So for example, uh, we have this sort of you know, minimize and maximize thing that we can do it with uh, with Windows. I like to do that same technique in dashboards. I use it very, very commonly 
when I have a, a kind of a packed dashboard and we have a lot of information and some of the information might, might need to be expanded uh, so that we can see it a little bit more easily. I use it really often with jitter plots, small jitter plots on a dashboard. I allow the user to kind of expand that. So this is a dashboard that I created for a different blog post. I won't get into the details of that, but you'll see I have nine charts on screen, all kind of small. And each one of them has this sort of pop out expand window. If we show that, I hit this little expand and it expands that chart. So it's a lot more easy, it's a lot easier for me to see what's going on in that chart. So this is really easy to do in Tableau. If we, I've gone to this dashboard here, I've removed all those buttons. The one kind of drawback is I, well, first off, I hardly ever do this with nine charts. I usually only do it with one. Uh, one drawback is you're going to have to duplicate a dashboard. I'm okay with duplicating dashboards. I don't love duplicating sheets, but I'm okay with duplicating dashboards. So let's let's do that for one of these charts. I'm going to duplicate this dashboard. We're going to do it for this this chart down here. So what I really want to do is keep everything the same, except I want to keep that one chart on there. So I'm going to just start deleting some containers of the of the stuff I don't want. Each. Probably should only put a couple charts on here. So you have to see me delete eight different charts. All right. So now we have this main dashboard, and we're going to put the little pop out thing here, and we have this sort of zoomed in dashboard. So just like before, let's drag a, drag a navigation button to our view. We are going to navigate to the min max demo two. Very creative naming. We're going to go image button. I'm, I'm here and I'm going to choose this pop out button. I'm not going to spend much time formatting and getting the size right. Then I'm going to come over to this dashboard and kind of do the opposite. We're going to go min max demo image and we're going to choose this pop in button. Again, I'm not going to spend any time getting this perfectly clean. And now, if we simply click the pop out, we have a zoom in window and the pop in, we go back to the main dashboard. So a technique I use in a ton of different work dashboards, just so I'll give users a little more, uh, to be able to allow users to see those charts a little bit more easily. I also like to use dashboard navigation buttons for a table of contents. So kind of the background behind this is in March when uh, COVID really struck the United States, I was asked to create an unemployment dashboard for our, for our company as well as for other users. So this is actually something on, on Tableau Public. And we just really wanted to understand the impact of employment, what it looks like and, and be able to track when it starts to trend downward. As I dug into this data, it was really, really interesting. And I ended up with 18 dashboards, 18 of them in a single workbook. So uh, it was pretty uh, intense dash, uh, workbook. And I didn't really know how to do the navigation. I thought about maybe having just like a standard table of contents where you just have words and you click on a button and it takes you to that dashboard. But I really wanted it to be visual. So what I ultimately built was this sort of visual table of contents. You have you know, all these different dashboards and you can click on this button to navigate to that dashboard. So how do we do that? Fairly simple. If you go to a dashboard, you're probably aware, you can actually go to dashboard, export image, and it will export an image of the dashboard. I've done that already for these four dashboards. And what we can do is use those as navigation buttons. So I'm gonna do this. It'll be a little sloppy. It'll be nearly as neat as I would normally do. Um, so I've got a vertical container. I'm gonna drop in a horizontal container and another horizontal container. Double click these and distribute them evenly because if I don't, I'm gonna, not gonna look very nice. Now I'm gonna just start dragging in navigation buttons. Again, we're just gonna do this with four dashboards, not 18. Okay, so now I've got four different buttons. I'm going to come here. I am going to tell this one to navigate to demo table of contents one. Grab an image button. We're going to grab that first image of uh, our dashboard. Do the same thing here. Demo TOC two image button. Grab our second one. 
and I'm not going to make you watch me do all four here. So now we have navigation buttons. Um, they're not super clear, so I like to come up here to layout, maybe put a little border around there. When I do that, it kind of is way out to the side. So maybe we want to put some padding here. Maybe I don't know, I can totally guess here. Let's say guess right. 60. Yeah, pretty close. We can clean this up so we, this border is kind of you know nice and tight around this image. Then we can add text. And we ultimately have this really nice visual uh, table of contents, just like you see here. Um, this is uh, something I have a video on, and uh, lots of other people in the community have started to use that. I think it's a really nice tool to um, allow more easily, uh, easy navigation for, for your users. But one thing you're probably looking at, you're probably looking at this chart and seeing this big spike in March, and you're saying, but Kevin, it doesn't look like that anymore. Unemployment has gone way down. Or if you're looking at this county map, you're seeing these really dark spots. Well, unemployment is not nearly that bad anymore. Well, truth is, when I created this, this table of contents, I created it in March. I created it when, when it might have been April, but I created it when there were huge spikes in unemployment. And um, I haven't updated those images. Remember, I just took uh, stat static images of the dashboards and I'm using them for, for navigation buttons. You might say, well, that's deceiving. That may, that's deceiving to my users. Uh, I don't want to do that. Okay. Well, I could agree. I think for the most part, uh, I do do this uh, on our, our Chamber Public dashboard. Um, and I think it's small enough where uh, it doesn't really impact things. But if you believe it's uh, deceiving, we can make a dynamic table of contents. So if we go to this blank dashboard, if we're building any dashboard, what do we drag to the dashboard? We drag sheets to the dashboard. And then we set up the data in the back end to update regularly, right? So all of our different sheets in a dashboard are updating with our data. So we can build a table of contents, a visual table of contents using sheets versus the images. So I've got, I'm just gonna do this with two different uh, dashboards. So we got this first dashboard, the second dashboard. Um, this is really the main sheet. Uh, this is kind of secondary. So we're going to focus on this one. And uh, for the second one, maybe we'll just do this one. So what I'm going to do, instead of dragging out navigation buttons and using images, I'm just going to drag sheets onto the view. And again, I would normally tile this, but I'm not going to do that for now. So we have one sheet here. We have a second sheet here. The one kind of word of caution, I would say, is sometimes when you're you're developing something for a really small view on, on a dashboard, um, you might want to read, might want to kind of design the sheet for it. So I've seen where people do this and they actually duplicate sheets. I don't love duplicating sheets in Tableau just because it's more work to maintain. Um, but for something like this, if you really wanted to have a dynamic uh, table of contents, you might want to duplicate sheet. For now, I think it looks pretty decent. Um, but the problem is we've got this sheet, we got both these sheets and they're going to update with our data, but how do we click on that to do some navigations? Well, that will lead us into our next section. And I'll come back to that uh, dynamic uh, table of contents here momentarily. So our next section is going to focus on transparent shapes and images. This, in my experience, is something that 99% of users in Tableau don't use, and um, maybe because it's just kind of weird. So let me show you what the heck a transparent image is in the first place. So I'm in PowerPoint. I'm going to go to insert. I'm going to click this square. I'm going to drag out a square. I have this yellow square. I can right click on this yellow square and pick save as image, and I can bring that into Tableau as a shape or an image, right? what if I were to go up to format and I was to remove the shape fill? There's an option for no fill. So we've removed the shape fill. You can see it's showing the background through the center of it. And what if I were to go to the shape outline and click no outline? All of a sudden, I have no image. Or do I? There is an image there. It's just completely transparent. So I just like that yellow square, I could right click on here and save this as an image. Well, I've done that already. And I have this whole repository of transparent shapes in my shapes repository um, that I'll use within my dashboards. And I use these constantly. Every single day in every single workbook, I use transparent shapes and images. So what can we do with them? 
lots and lots of different things. So I'm going to talk start first about these this dimension table. I use dimension tables all the time just to show hierarchies. We don't have any measures on this view, just category, subcategory, manufacturer. We kind of see this hierarchy of, of data. Um, but we have this kind of annoying ABC thing. If you know Jeff Schaefer, Data Plus Science website, he wrote a whole blog post on this. And I provided one of the options on how to fix that. But one of the typical options we'll kind of walk through and show you the problems are um, to get rid of that is the first one that I learned in my career was just turn it to a polygon. Boom, it's gone. Fantastic, right? The problem is I like navig or, excuse me, I like animation on my dashboards. I like things to move. I think the smooth transition are wonderful. So I use animation in every single dashboard. Polygons don't animate. And the problem with that is if you have a sheet with polygons on your dashboard, nothing on your dashboard will, will, will animate. So I avoid the polygon option. What I've seen a lot of people do is take a circle and just move the opacity to zero. Perfect, right? Well, you get this sort of weird hover thing and you can actually select the circle. It's just a weird experience for a user. I don't think we should be doing that. Change this color back up. Or we might put an inline calculation of quote, quote, throw that on text and change this to text if I can find it. And it's gone. Well, we still have this sort of weird thing. You see quote, quote in the, in the tool clip for one thing, and we still can select this. Ken kind of mentioned this with the band thing, right? All right, you can kind of get see where I'm getting at. All these things have their problems. Maybe they're not major, but if we just change this to, to a shape and go to more shapes, you'll see that I use these transparent shapes so often. I have it with an at symbol to bring it to the top. If I hit, I, now I have six different transparent shapes. You can't see them because they're transparent. And uh, if I pick this and apply one of those transparent shapes, it disappears just like all the other options. But the nice thing is nothing shows in the tooltip. If I select this window, nothing selected. One of the key components of these transparent shapes is you can't select them, which makes them super useful for a lot of different things. So this is my go-to when I wanna get rid of the ABC, I just slap in a transparent shape. For work, uh, we do a lot of modeling. And what we try to do is improve our profits based on um, the percentage of accounts. So, for example, if we were to um, look at 30% of our accounts, we would expect at random about 30% of our profit. Well, we built these little models to improve that. So, for this one, this model, uh, we're getting about 47% of the profit at 30% of the accounts. When we build um, product sheets and brochures and things, we like to focus people's energy on one particular percentage. So how do we do that? Well, there's some technique. Ken kind of talked about the hide function earlier. You can certainly do that. I think the most common way that people would do is to write a calculation. Um, I should note that I'm, using, I'm showing the sum of profit and I'm done a dual axis, one to show the line, one to show a circle. Um, if, but if we wanted to show just one circle, most of the time we would create a calculation. If the percentage of accounts down here equals 0.3, then give me the percentage of profit, else null, and yeah, I know you don't need the else null, but I like to write it out. Then we would throw this on the dual axis and make it a circle mark type, and okay, that's great. First off, I like my dual axis to be the same pill. I think it makes it easier. And we can do this without even writing a single calculation. Uh, all we need to do is go to the circle mark and we'll change this to a shape. We'll take percentage of accounts and we'll move it to shape. Now, if we go to shape, what we see is we, for every percent for the percentages of accounts, zero to, to one, uh, we've got this, the circle mark. Well, all I'm going to do is change all into a transparent shape and then change one of them to a filled circle. So we've done this without even writing a calculation, without changing our dual axis in any way. And it's really easy to flip and flop these. We can actually do this with a parameter if we wanted to. So super simple to uh, to notate one particular point. We can do something similar if we want to say notate the last point. I love to notate just the last point, the most recent point. If we were to do that uh, with a calculation, we might write something like. Um, Probably should make this window a little bit bigger. 
Sorry about that. We may say something like, if the month of the date is equal to the fixed max month date, right? Then give me the sum of sales. And then we would put that on our dual axis and it would show that, you know what, again, I, I like to keep things simple. So what I've done is just create this simple calculation, just a true false. It says, if the month of the date equals the max date, it's true, right? We go to the circle mark, we put, we change this to a shape mark. We put this on shape, we click this, we have a true and a false. So let's go to the falses, we change this to a transparent shape, change the true to a circle mark. And we have this nice, point at the end. So really, really easy uh, with very few calculations, very little work to create this, uh, these, these marks uh, that you, that you want. Ken mentioned this bands before, and he said, maybe there was a way to, to fix that. Well, he was just setting me up. This is weird. This is a weird um, user interface for me. And I've always, it always bugged me because because of this weird outline. And on top of this, you get this blue color that may or may not go with your dashboard and you have no control over this blue selection color. I don't like it. You can fix this with, guess what? A transparent shape. I'm gonna duplicate this sheet. Right now, you see we're just using text just like we would with a normal band. And again, we can select that and we get this weird, weird thing. So if we change this to a shape, we'll, we'll get a circle here. We still have this, we, this ability to, to, to change the circle. Now, some people make them really big, but you can still always select the circle. So change the shape to, guess what? The transparent shape. Now we have no ability to actually select. We don't get that, that outline. We don't get that blue highlight. We do have this really nice kind of graying out effect as I select a, a band. And, and this is really nice if you're doing filters or something like that using these bands. And you can clear that as well. So you can kind of see the difference here between a text band and a band with a shape and the number as a label. Much cleaner approach. I use it in every single band I create. That one is from Josh Tapley, by the way. So give him the credit for that. I also got one from, from Luke Stanky, a fellow Zen master. He looked at the sum of sales by subcategory and he's looking at it by year. So what he's showing is the sum of sales, um, sum of sales for 2020 but he's looking at the change from 2019. So phones was number uh, number two in 2019. So it actually moved up one spot. Chairs was number one in 2019, actually moved down one spot. These red and blue numbers are a little bit hard to understand. So naturally we're gonna add a little icon to it. So we add a little shape. So uh, he's got these circle marks, but maybe we'll come to the shape and we'll make this one a an up arrow. This one, a down arrow and hit okay. And we can see really, really easy to understand. This one moved up one, this one moved down one, this one moved up three, and then what's this one? This one is one that didn't move at all. So we don't really want a shape at all. I guess we could throw a white shape out there, uh, but if it was on top of a axis ruler or, or a grid line, then that would block the grid line. Again, same, same technique. We're just gonna add a transparent shape this one clearly hasn't changed over time. So we have these up and downs and this one hasn't changed. Really nice way to show that information. So up to this point, we've done nothing but show transparent shapes, but we can actually use transparent images in our dashboards as well. And they have lots of cool use cases. So you may know if I type out a hyperlink in Tableau in text, it'll it'll work. So I've, here I've typed out a link to Tableau's Wikipedia page, and if I click on that, it's it's a hyperlink, right? But what if I just want to embed it in text? Most of the time, we don't want to type out a whole hyperlink. If I write Tableau software, I want them to just click on Tableau software. Well, in this text, I've just made the text blue and underlined it. It's not actually a hyperlink. You can't make it a hyperlink in, te in text. But what you can do is use a transparent image. What I'm going to do is drag this image to the view. In the target URL, I'm going to paste that that uh, Wikipedia page. Maybe we put in Tableau's main page, whatever. And I'm going to here, and I'm going to choose a shape. So I'm going to go to my shapes repository just because I have a bunch of them there, and I'm going to pick one of these transparent shapes. So I got a transparent shape. I got a target URL tied to it. 
I just size this appropriately and I start to hover, you'll see I get that little hand icon. And if I click it, I now have a hyperlink in text within Tableau. And I don't have to type the whole thing out. So that's really, really nice thing. I use that all the time at the bottom of my blog post to allow people to click to read a blog post or to go to my Tableau public page. Lots of different cool use cases, uses it at work a lot too. And now we can kind of circle back to the dynamic table of contents. Before we had these sheets that look really nice and they're gonna update with our data, but we couldn't figure out a way to actually create navigation. Well, we can use that concept of transparent images to do that. So I am gonna drag out a navigation button. I'm gonna tell it to navigate to page one. I am gonna use an image and I go pick one of these transparent buttons. So now we have this transparent button overlaying this sheet that's gonna update. And as I click it, it feels like I'm clicking on the sheet, but I'm really clicking on the navigation button and it's gonna navigate me to that uh, page. We've done, we built these at work quite often um, for really kind of sensitive data where we wanted to show in, in the little icons and little thumbnails actually updated data. And it works really, really nicely. That same concept I use for this blog post. If I wrote a blog post on transparent shapes and the dashboard, I had a dashboard, a Tableau public dashboard that went along with it. I wanted a kind of a nice navigation on the front screen. Um, I could have created all these as individual buttons, but instead I just created it in PowerPoint and uh, you know had these little hex shapes kind of fit in together. So this is one big background image, but you might have noticed as I was hovering over here, I had these transparent shapes on top of all these different uh, little spots. And these are just the little buttons that are allowing us to navigate um, through this. I think Lindsay Betzendahl actually wrote a blog post at the same time I was doing this. So you can check that out on, on her site. I also use uh, buttons to kind of filter data or highlight data a lot. This one's actually filtering by year. So if I click on this button, this uses a parameter action. I'm not going to go into details of the parameter action piece, but if I click on this button, you kind of see this weird looking thing. You know, this is a button I created in PowerPoint and we get this kind of odd highlighting, uh, uh, not highlighting, but border around it. And I just don't think it's very clean. And there's been lots of talk about the ways and methods to do that. There, there are a bunch of different ways, but my preferred method is to use a transparent shape. So what I do is I duplicate that sheet and you'll actually see this. I duplicate that buttons sheet and I replace the buttons with transparent buttons. I still allow the parameter actions to change these colors and all that but I, I implement the, the parameter actions on these transparent buttons. So there's actually four transparent buttons on top of that. And as I click them, you can see how much cleaner this is. Transparent shapes don't get selected. So we don't have that sort of weird outline, just a much cleaner thing than what I just showed. You may be aware of my no polygons technique that uses a transparent shape for, uh, to allow you to use the tooltip properly. Ken's scrollable timeline uses a transparent shape. And you may have seen recently my data fam finder business. This data fam finder was intended to help users kind of get connected, uh, Tableau users across the world. Uh, my example is I'm gonna move to Ontario. I'm not really, but let's say I'm gonna move to Toronto, Ontario, and I wanted to connect with other users in Toronto, Ontario. I wanna be able to click on Toronto, Ontario and tell me what other users are within hundred miles of me. Uh, so you can register your name to the data fam finder if you haven't already, and uh, we can help people connect uh, connect with you or help you connect with others. Uh, it's a really kind of cool tool. But what I wanted to do is I knew that this would be a work in progress. I knew that these these red marks are the the people that have registered their names, um, and and that's nice. But what I wanted people to be able to do is click anywhere in this map to be able to find people in their area. For example. I want to click here. I live here in Brazil. I want to click on this map and it does take a little bit to load and it draws this buffer and uses a distance calculation and tells me everybody in that area. Well, you can't do that unless there's a mark there. I can't, uh, I can't use this buffer. What, what's really happening is as I click, it's sending the lat long values and then it's uh, creating a buffer based on that. But I can't send a value to a parameter if there's no mark, right? I have to click on a mark. Well, truth is, this is my most massive use of transparent shapes and images ever. 
And there are 27,000 transparent shapes in this visualization. I found a data set of all the cities in the world. I uploaded that to a Google Sheet and stacked all the actual people on top of that Google Sheet. And I brought in any mark that wasn't corresponding with an actual person as you can see right here, a transparent image. So if I actually double click this and assign an image to it, you'll see, boom, those are all my different cities that I brought in as a transparent image. And what that allows me to do is to click pretty much anywhere in this map and it'll draw a buffer circle and do the distance calculation and tell you who is in that uh, general area. So really kind of a cool technique. All right, that is really all we have. Lots of different cool techniques, probably some that have uh, rarely used. Uh, and again, in my opinion, should be. Um, again, here's the website that you can go to see all those different uh, blog posts associated with these techniques. And I know we're a little bit long, but happy to take questions if anybody has them. Hi guys, I do have a couple of quick questions um, from the audience that haven't been answered yet. Um, so you obviously answered uh, when this will be released. So people just uh, jot down this website um, and you'll have access to whatever you need and what was talked about today. Um, one question that came in is, is there a recommended limit on how many sheets can be used in a dashboard without impacting performance too much? Uh, Ken, I don't, I don't know if you, I have an answer. I mean, I think as you add sheets, you're going to be impacting performance. So, uh, you know, and it really, it's it's more than what's the number of sheets is it, you know what's on your view are they complicated views are there lots of marks are there use of table calculations so i think that kind of thing impacts um, your performance a lot more than with the number of sheets if you put 100 or 200 or 300 sheets in a in a dashboard you're probably going to see uh, uh, impacted performance i will tell you that my boss jeff schaefer has um tested this before and successfully put over a thousand sheets in a in a tablet workbook and it still worked uh, it might have been a little bit slow but it still worked so um i don't necessarily think it's the sheets that are the major problem it's more the design of the uh, of the dashboard itself so can anything to add to that no nope, i was going to say the exact same thing all right and i think um pretty much everything that uh can be covered here will be so uh, thank you so much for your time. The presentation was so good and excellent. We're just happy to have you here. And we're honored that it was the first presentation you made of this type. So thank you so much for participating and getting up so early in the morning to do this. <laughs> and I hope everybody uh, could enjoy and appreciate uh, the time and effort that went into this. Um, thank you, uh, Ken and Kevin. It was an honor to have you with us today. Thanks, thank you. Thanks guys. Thanks again, I appreciate it.